United States has always been a representative of freedom and liberty. However, the citizens did not prepare for the future forecast of handing their freedom over to a degrading culture. As a result, Lady Liberty has morphed into a woman in bondage. It seems clear that God has predestined a plan for America. While her name is not mentioned in the Bible directly, her participation in the end times prophecies is certain. While the nation of America turned to God for blessings and counsel from its beginnings, the opposite is true today. What happened to her? Before answering that question, we first need to explore the importance of what happens when a ship's captain neglects to check the forecast before setting sail. Here's what Michael Gibbons tells us. I'm a pilot of a ship, the original pilots, if you will. We steer ships and get paid to land them safely, like airplane pilots. I'm just a pilot, don't even own a little bit of my ship. Owner has beard, beady eyes, talks to everybody around trying to gather opinions, even the priest of the Temple of Jupiter. For what reason? I cannot fathom. It's late in the fall, and everyone knows it's risky to sail now. Who needs to inquire from beyond? When the sailing gets tough, this is where the help is going to come from. The pilot. I'm piloting a giant grain ship going from Alexandria to one of Rome's port cities. They are boarding midway at the port of Sidon. Small port, we're the last ship of the sailing season, so it must be their last chance. Paul's friend, Dr. Luke, the one who keeps yapping about the gospel, tells me that Paul is even more special than I think. He's an apostle. He does miracles, speaks in tongues, imparts the Holy Spirit, and is a prophet. He has to explain what each of these terms mean. I'm interested in the prophet part. Future looks bleak to me. Luke explains that there are two kinds of prophets. One kind explains truth in a situation. Paul does that all the time. The other kind of prophet tells the future. Now, Luke has not seen Paul do that, but wouldn't be surprised if he could. We end up in the port of Fair Havens on the island of Crete. Paul overhears our plan to sail to a safer harbor 50 miles away. He butts in and says the plan is foolhardy. If we sail, we will surely suffer great damage to the ship and cargo and maybe our own lives. I look at Luke. Is Paul predicting the future? Luke just shrugs. We cannot stay where we are and we cannot go back. The owner of the ship decides to stay behind. No surprise there. But I am surprised the centurion and his prisoner don't stay behind too. I guess a centurion cannot look cowardly. The next morning, unexpectedly, a gentle wind out of the south. So 276 of us rush to board the hulking vessel. Each prays to their own god. Well, except me, I don't have one. They pray the south wind will last long enough for us to reach Port Phoenix. 50 miles, that's all the window that we need. Turns out that it might as well have been a thousand miles away. The wind shifts to come from the northeast, from the island. Not at all a gentle breeze now, it's hurricane force. There's nothing we can do about it. We haul in the oars, plug up the oar holes on the side of the ship. No one even has time to tie themselves to the deck with the ropes they brought. Everyone bolts below. I stay up on deck and use the rudder to keep the vessel from listing. A sideways ship? Oh. I put it out of my mind. Focus is the key. We're swept to sea. The sailors haul the lifeboat on board and we tie it down. The sea gets rougher. We pass ropes under our hull and tie them tightly. Don't want it to come apart of the seams. I do everything humanly possible to keep the ship from turning sideways, capsizing. Water seeps through every crack in the entire boat. The wheat from Africa, ruined. Romans will now starve. I'm not worried about them. I may never get a job as a pilot again if I survive. The ship goes low in the water. It's a quick decision. All hands on deck. Every sailor, slave, and passenger heaves our massive cargo of grain overboard. Bag after bag of money to be made. It's like we're flinging my retirement into the sea. The ship lightens, but it's still too heavy. 
So we toss all the anchors and rigging overboard. We form a bucket brigade to bail water continually. Imagine a tiny cork adrift on a raging sea. I'm no longer a pilot, large and in charge. I'm a pathetic, panic-stricken passenger. The future looks bleak indeed. For days and days, we cannot see the sun or stars. I, I have no idea where we are. I'm terrified of running aground and dying. All hope of being saved, gone. It's over. I, I've given up. I, I look at the centurion. He looks at me. Like thousands before us, we're going to die because we started sailing too late in the season. And then, a loud voice over the pounding of the wind and rain. Paul shouts like a crazy man. He looks me dead center in my eye. You should have listened to me and stayed in port. You would have spared yourself this damage and loss. Should I hit him, I think? I hate I told you so kinds of people. Honestly, I don't care about the damage and loss. That's the ship owner's problem and he abandoned us. My problem is there is no way I can save our lives. Paul, flashes this big smile, but keep your courage. The ship will be destroyed, but not one person will be lost. Yelling at the top of his lungs, an angel of my God came to me last night. He told me I will definitely stand trial before Caesar, and he has mercifully decreed that all of you will live. So keep your courage. All will be as my God says. <sighs> oh yeah, and, and something about we will have to run aground on some island. There is no human solution certain calamity. And Paul tells us to trust in his God. I look at Luke. Luke shakes his head. I'm sure Paul is telling us the future. I tell the centurion, we must follow his directions exactly. And he agrees. On the 14th night, my sailors sense that we are nearing land. They hatch a plan to get to shore themselves. Paul's a prophet. He's not deceived. He tells the centurion that the sailors have to stay with the group for all to be saved. Without hesitation, the centurion has his soldiers cut the ropes to the boat and let it float away. My sailors are furious, but helpless. At daylight, Paul tells everyone to eat so they will have strength. He reminds us that none of the 276 of us will be harmed. Do you know how hard it is to eat on a rough sea? How about when you've been tossed aimlessly for weeks? How about when you think you're going to die? Hungry? Paul gives thanks to his God and digs in. Can't beat him, join him. We finish, then throw what's left overboard to lighten the ship. The ship runs aground on a sandbar. The ropes burst, the wood planks splinter apart, we abandon everything, and the ship disintegrates. An hour later, 276 shivering men stand safely on the shore in nothing but their tunics. It's hard to tell the slaves from the soldiers, sailors, or prisoners. Paul Scott is correct. All of us survive with no harm. Paul has proven himself to be a future-telling type of prophet. And these eyes get to witness it. We've landed on Malta. Three months later, the weather clears and they give us provisions to travel on to Rome. A different ship takes us from Malta to Puteoli, a port of Rome. It's a grain ship from Alexandria. Its owner and pilot had the good sense to winter in Malta instead of pressing on to Rome. The ship's figurehead carving? The twin Roman gods, Castor and Pollux? What gives? I just can't seem to get away from other people's gods. As with many other things, the Romans stole these gods from Greece. There are many versions of the Greek myths around Castor and Pollux, but they all revolve around the themes of immortality and a god becoming a man. So, along with physical sustenance, life, if you will, this green ship brings a dubious message of immortality and a god becoming a man. The irony? Mm. Along with a spiritual sustenance, life, if you will, Paul brings Rome a message of immortality and god becoming a man. Paul's message? Hmm. God so loves the world that he sent his only son, Jesus, so that anyone who believes in him will have eternal life 
instead of death. If Paul is a future-telling prophet, then my future may not look so bleak. In fact, it looks positively rosy. America, one of the more complex countries in the world. Where does she fit into end times? How will she impact one world governance? And more importantly, was she founded as a Christian nation? While these are great questions, the answers are not openly accepted by the Christian world. In America's founding days, two groups of individuals fought for dominance, the Christian pilgrims and the European masons, who were and are universalist. When we gaze into our present day fight for our country, we see the same two groups warring for like-minded dominance. Universalism believes that everybody will ultimately be saved through the God of their choice. Most of our founding members were Unitarian Universalists who propagated tolerance of all religions and self-chosen gods. While the pilgrims believed salvation was found in a single God, Jesus Christ. This narrow-minded view, including the expansive difference between these views, created the original battle over the newfound land. Thus, the Universalists advanced freedom of religions. The Christian politicals were passionate regarding the freedom of Christianity. In due time, the Christians lost the battle. The misnomer of this fight is logical. Freedom of religion is freedom for all religions. The founding members' rationale was all gods lead to the same God. Thus, no matter what God you pick, ultimately, everybody will be saved and go to heaven. While I understand their Babylonian thinking, it is not what Jesus said. His words are, no man comes unto the Father, but through me. Since the biblical method of salvation was narrow-minded, the groups propagated a plurality of gods. In time, took the forefront of America's religious dominance. In short, when Jesus said the road to destruction is wide and many are on it, the lion's share of freedom for all religions took the lead. Therefore, we see Jesus' words and warnings come to life. America is self-destructing at every turn. Point one, no country is Christian. Countries cannot receive Jesus Christ as their savior. Only individuals within a nation can do that. With this logic, we can dismiss the ideology of America being a Christian nation. Point two. If the Bible says the road to destruction is wide and many are on it, numerically speaking, the wide road wins in the end times. Point three. During the days when authentic Christians dominate culture and missions, America was known for being the launching pad for global missions. While this gives the impression that America was a Christian nation, it actually furthered the misnomer of America being a Christian nation. However, this movement challenged other religions to step up their game. Ironically, this began during the sexual revolution period of America. Final point. During the sexual revolution, denominations began to compete with one another. 
Many churches took the ideas from this revolution and began to massage them into the church, creating sexual and gender liberation within the church leadership. Once this happened, the gender wars populated the culture of gender-identified acceptability. It is common to see homosexual pastors and members dominating certain denominations. This movement started the popularized label of conservative Christian versus liberal Christians. Until recently, America has been known to be Israel's friend and protector. This old-fashioned idea was birthed during the time that Christianity dominated culture. Secondly, when the Jews defected to the United States during World War II, many Jews moved quickly into positions of authority, such as government positions. However, since the masses have been known for hating Jews, the groups couched in the freedom of religion took up arms and began to remove Israel as a protected nation by America. According to the Bible, when a person or nation does not support the Jews and their land, Israel, God turns on those who refute Israel. This contributed to America's most recent descent into self-destruction. America has been known for being a land of the free. What the citizens of America don't understand, God granted freedom because of the protected Israel and the grafted members, authentic Christians, were accepted into the love and devotion that God gave America initially to protect Israel. As soon as the nation of America stopped this protection, the fears of the political founders, who were Christians, surfaced in our daily reality. Thus, Christians and Jews are the least supported groups in what was once the greatest nation in the world. When America turned its back on Jews and Christians, their Bible, the Holy Word, faded into history. The reason for many American citizens working to deconstruct the Constitution is simple. Once you remove the Bible of the people, you can rule them with the powers of global governance. The U.S. Constitution is the Bible for we the people. The Holy Bible is the constitution for godly living. If, or should I say when, these Bibles are removed, one world governance will surface, which are the birth pangs of the Antichrist. So what is the role that America plays in the end times? I believe that the United States of America will be the global leader of setting up for the Antichrist, which places her in the front seat of global signs of the end times. America is the melting pot of religions. When we ask the question of America's relevance in biblical prophecy, we need to understand a logical conclusion. The simple logic connection is that America will be taken over by a superpower nation that is mentioned in biblical prophecies. When you notice our political leaders slowly handing over our powers to the United Nations or the European Union, you will understand my logic. I believe that America will be incorporated into the European coalition. Until that day happens, America will covertly use the freedom of religions to matriculate the Antichrist modality of one world religion. It must be noted that no other nation in the world has mastered the art of spiritual plurality 
and freedom of religions, as in the case of America. Most countries stick to one God, not America. Moral universalism, progressivism, cultural relativism, racism, and mysticism are founding building blocks of the Masons that founded the country of America. Simply put, America is the perfect system of governance to establish a one world religion, led by the Antichrist false prophet, spoken of in the book of Revelation. One of my mentors made it clear to me that when a country fades into moral decay, as in the case of old Babylon, destruction is right around the corner. Here's a sample list you could watch for. Number one, the removal of the institution of marriage. Number two, the fading of male leadership. Three, removing parental rights from the institution of the family. Four, an introduction to same-sex marriages and unions. Five, the deconstruction of national founders and heroes. Six, when politicals or others use the Bible for political gain. Seven, a widespread attitude of feminism, narcissism, and anti-male. Eight, when adultery and immorality is an acceptable expression of humanity. Nine, children rise to kill their parents. Ten, murder will fill the daily news over common news. Eleven, the fading or removal of God's word from society. Now a reality statement most will refute. America, in the end, will be likened to the old Babylon, Sodom and Gomorrah. In each case, God destroyed the foundation of these immoral governance systems and their people. Personally, I believe until the moment of the rapture, America will stand. However, after the rapture, when the Antichrist demands the masses to worship a single God, him, America will most likely be the first to go. You see, Satan, in his organic state, hates the freedom of religions. Until next time. When you're a pastor and somebody comes and says to you, what is the fear of God? You usually respond, it means to reverence God. And, and we usually say, it doesn't mean to be afraid of him, to be, a, to be scared of him, but to fear him. And I realized when I went back through this this time that we've really not been accurate when we've said that. There is a fear of God that is awesome dread. And here's the, here's the way I know that. In the interpretation of scripture, uh, there's a thing called the law of first reference, which right. means when you see it the first time, well, the first time the word fear appears in the Bible is when Adam and Eve sin and they're in the garden and they hear God's coming to see them and they're afraid. Right. And the Bible says they were afraid. And I remember thinking they weren't in awe of God. They were stone cold scared. That was awesome dread. It was the first time it appeared in the Bible. If you go through the scripture, you see this, you see people when they have any kind of a reference to God, they fall on their face. All of the things that I went through one time and looked at every place where somebody had some sort of an encounter with God. And it wasn't your hands up in the air and worship. It was falling on your face in dread. He is an awesome God. He is to be feared. And you know, when I travel today, people say, what's wrong with our nation? Right. We've lost the fear of God. We don't have that. You know, th there's some very noticeable things that you and I probably, we, they just happen. And for instance, when I, was, when I was growing up, my father was a pastor. Even though I knew most of the people in, in my country, in my class, where I lived weren't Christians, they respected Christians. Right. Even though I knew they didn't necessarily know God, they realized that to demean his name was not right. right. Uh, there, was a, there was a kind of respect in our culture for who God was, even if we didn't believe in him. And I must say to you, that's gone. That we don't have any sense of that in him. God is as, as much of a game for jokes and 
and, uh, and, and all of that. And when that happens, when the fear of God is gone, when we no longer respect him, where is there to go? Because it's not, it, it is astonished devotion, but it's also awesome dread. The both of those are true. And he said that he wished he could obliterate four words out of the vocabulary of most people and, and out of the Bible, and that is the fear of God, as he felt it was dis, it was abusive and, and all of that. And I remember thinking when he wrote that, where in the world does he think anybody's talking about that today? That's not even anybody's discussion. It's not an issue for most people. They haven't even talked about the fear of God. It's been lost almost to a generation of followers of Christ. The Bible tells us that sin is a separator. Yeah. Sin is a separator that removes us from fellowship with God. If we lose our fellowship with God, all we got left is, is uh, a, a relationship that's bankrupt and broken. And uh, the fear of God then is it's just an absent thing in our life. And when you, when you believe, you know, you, you mentioned some, some people in leadership, you know, a lot of guys I know who get to a certain place think they can live by another set of rules, right. that they've accomplished enough that they don't have to give an account any longer. When that happens, you have totally misunderstood who God is. God doesn't make us less responsible when we achieve uh, any kind of success. He makes us more responsible. And uh, that's certainly very evident in the scripture. And I remember the first time I ever read this, I thought about it for a long time and I believe it's true. And it goes like this, the man who truly fears God will never fear any other man. And I believe that's true. When we understand that the only thing that really counts in our lives ultimately is our relationship with Almighty God, the fear of disapproval by others goes away. That's just one reason you should cultivate the fear of God. I know people like that. I don't know that I am that person, but it's the kind of person I'd like to be. But I know people who are fearless because they have such an incredible fear of Almighty God.